Okay, um, hello everyone and thank you for attending. Uh, I'm just here to quickly introduce myself. I'm Elizabeth Denton and I'm the e-learning coordinator. Uh, we've got Tony Lawson who will be doing our presentation today. He's the Endpoint Assessment Manager. And alongside myself, I'll have my colleague Ian Holt, who also works in the e-learning team, and we'll both be able to answer any questions around e-logbook or e-learning. And we've also got Barry Williams, who will be able to answer questions around standards. Okay, um, just a little note on the um, questions you have. There's a and answer, question and answer box. Um, feel free to put your questions in there and they'll be answered by myself and my colleagues. Um, and we will have five minutes at the end for live question and answers as well. Um, so uh, the background to this, I did a bit of research with centres around e-logbook training and um, it became quite apparent that quite a few of you weren't comfortable with the difference between frameworks and standards. So we thought we'd take it right back to basics and do this presentation first. And then this session will lead on to future webinars, which will be around e-log book help. Um, and the next session will be roles and responsibilities within an e-log book setting. So if you do have any questions around e-log book, please feel free to answer them in the Q&A session. Okay, uh, that's it from me. So I'll hand over to Tony now. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for, for joining us this afternoon. As Elizabeth has explained, the, the presentation I'll be running through today will be sort of high level differences and what you can expect um, to implement with regard to apprenticeship standards. So we'll run through, I'll run through what I'm sure you're all familiar with and you've all been doing for several years with frameworks, identifying the key roles, responsibilities from that, and then what the differences are and the key roles, responsibilities within apprenticeship standards. Okay, Georgia, thank you. And the next one. Thanks. So obviously this, I hope I'm not teaching everybody to uh, suck eggs. I'm sure the majority of the people attending are familiar with frameworks. They've been with us for some time, but I'm basing my comparison on light vehicle being light vehicle for the automotive industry is the largest uh, qualification or framework or apprenticeship standard that we work with. So I'm going to focus or make my comparisons around the light vehicle route. However, the majority or many of the differences and the responsibilities do map across the rest of the apprenticeship standards. There will be some variations, but again, all of that specific detail can be found on our website or the uh, within the actual assessment plan. So if we start then from the beginning, apprenticeship frameworks, what does a light vehicle apprenticeship framework look like at the moment? So as you can see from uh, the slide on the picture at the moment, or the picture at the moment, how it's broken down, I should say on the slide, we have various components, starting with the VCQ, so the competency, the VRQ, with, uh, which embodies the repair principles, the ERR, and then we've got the functional skills being maths, English and ICT, along with the PLTS, so the personal learning thinking skills. So there's many components that actually make up a framework. Uh, and you would collate all of those components and then submit your application for certification for the framework once you've collated all of those components. Thanks, Georgia. So an apprenticeship standard, what does that look like in comparison? So normally, and again, this is based on the light vehicle route, the apprenticeship standard is normally delivered over a 36 month period. Now, although that is stated in the assessment plan, that is an expected time frame. You are not bound to 36 months. You can complete this in a shorter period or deliver it and put that apprentice in for EPA in a short period. Every apprentice on an apprenticeship standard must be on program for a minimum of one year and one week. As soon as that apprentice has been on program longer than that time frame they are eligible to be put forward for EPA. So although in the assessment plan, it does stipulate expected duration of 36 months, it doesn't have to be. That is totally down to your discretion as a training provider and 
where you believe that apprentice sits, whether for, you could use the example of an apprentice that has completed a level two framework, then obviously you're not gonna have to cover everything within the apprenticeship standard. A lot of those skills and knowledge that has been obtained in the level two framework, you could remove that element if you like, or just use that as a refresher and reduce their level three standard duration down from 36 months. On the flip side, you may have apprentices that have come on program that perhaps don't develop as quickly as expected. So it could go to 40 months. Like I say, that is totally down to you to manage. As long as that apprentice has been on a program minimum of one year and one week, you can put them in for EPA. Uh, you must also ensure that that apprentice completes a minimum of 20% off the job training. So off the job training, historically, is training that the training provider delivers when they come to college or they go on daily block release, whatever that might be. But it can be other delivery aspects. But again, that is quite a, a big package in itself. There is a lot of literature on that, on what actually covers or what is acceptable as off the job training, which I haven't got time to go into. That is a, a webinar on its own. But there is information on the IFATE website for that. There's also documents on the IMI website and the links for all of those will be later on in this presentation. So you will have them. They, each apprentice will also for the light vehicle route have to hold a, uh, an FGAS qualification. So they must have an FGAS qualification. It's stipulated within the, within the assessment plan that that is a mandated requirement. So they will have to have that qualification prior to going on to their EPA. They must also have a logbook, completed logbook. That logbook is a collation of evidence from the workplace against certain competencies that are stipulated in the assessment plan. It's just like you, you're all familiar with logbooks, if you like, but for frameworks, but there is a slight twist on that, which I'll come to a little bit later on, but there's, a logbook to collate evidence. Within that logbook or the logbook that IMI provides, there's also a professional discussion record. So we have a, be, sorry, there's a behavioral assessment record which contributes to the professional discussion, I should, should say. They need to complete that as well. So there's a logbook of progression and a behaviors assessment. Both of them elements contribute to the professional discussion within the endpoint assessment. They must also hold level two in maths and English prior to EPA. So those elements, FGAS, logbook, behavioral assessment, maths and English are all prerequisites that have to be in place before endpoint assessment. Thank you, Georgia. So that EPA process, you can see now on this slide, there, there's a set, um, there's set sequences that have to be followed for EPA. And again, this is still based on the light vehicle, but there is a similar pattern for most of the assessment plans. So you can see there on the far left that prior to EPA, there's a mandated requirement, as I've just said, to have FGAS certificate in place, maths and English at level two in place, and a completed logbook, which includes behavioral assessment. So they are your five mandated requirements that you must have. In addition to that, there must also be a tri-party agreement. So a tri-party agreement is a binding document, if you like, that is signed by the apprentice, the training provider, and the employer stating or declaring that all of those prerequisites are in place and that all three parties agree that the apprentice is ready for endpoint assessment. Now, I need to stipulate or emphasize that if any one of those parties, whether it's the apprentice, the employer, or the training provider, do not believe that that apprentice is ready to go for EPA, I strongly advise you do not just sign it as a tick box exercise and put them in for EPA. It is a, a stringent test, uh, an EPA, and if you're not 100% convinced that that apprentice is ready, please just don't sign that tripartite agreement off and throw them in and hope for the best. 
it is something to be reviewed and considered if the apprentice is in a good position and competent then yeah great put them forward if they're not or you have any doubt please address those doubts before you put them in for epa so when you've got the tripartite agreement in place all the prerequisites you can then move on to the first actual uh, assessment element for light vehicle that consists of the knowledge uh, assessments the knowledge assessments under normal con conditions and this is pre covid-19 which I'll just expand on a little bit in a moment but pre covid-19 in the assessment plan for light vehicle it was a mandated requirement that the first element of the assessment for a light vehicle apprentice is the knowledge assessment they must sit the knowledge assessments and pass those assessments before the apprentice can progress on to the skills testing, which is the next element. Now, under current COVID-19 flexibilities that have been agreed by the IFATE and the uh, external quality assurance provider, that mandated requirement has actually been relaxed. So they can, an apprentice currently can sit the online tests and not necessarily pass them and still progress onto the skills testing. However, that is an interim measure and that could be removed at any time by the IFATE. So that is something just to be mindful of. So once that apprentice has passed or completed the knowledge test, they then progress onto the skills assessment. That skill assessment is undertaken over a two day period for light vehicle and it's made up of multiple assessments skills tasks which will consist of diagnostic and repair so it's not just a case of diagnosing something and walking away for the latest version apo3 of the light vehicle it is diagnose and repair upon completing the skills tasks the final element of the epa for light vehicle is the professional discussion so that is a face-to-face -face professional discussion between the apprentice and the independent assessor. That will last for approximately one hour. And during that professional discussion, the questions or the discussion will be focused on the behaviors, which is evidence collated within the logbook, and specific tasks that the apprentice has carried out in their workplace which must be diagnostic and repair tasks. So that is what the discussion will be based on. It is only competencies and evidence that's been uploaded into the logbook. There's nothing outside of that. There's not gonna be any curveballs for the apprentice to deal with. So providing the apprentice is comfortable and happy with what's within their own logbook, there shouldn't be any surprises during the professional discussion. Okay, Georgia, thank you. So what's involved for the apprentice? As I said, we have touched that in the previous uh, slide, but just a little bit more uh, information. The EVA is a set of assessments that's basically delivered under exam conditions. So what do I mean by exam conditions? Easiest way to compare, I suppose, EPA is GCSE, AS, uh, A-levels. They are controlled exams set at specific dates and times and conducted and observed by independent assessors. There is nobody else involved within the assessment. Uh, like I say, it is very controlled. If an apprentice doesn't turn up for their exam, with us knowledge, skills or behaviours at the agreed time with, and has no justification for not turning up, then that will be documented as a fail, the same as it would for any other exam. So these assessments, where do they take place? What, what do they look like? The assessments, again, there's a wide variation across multiple apprenticeship standards that the IMI are, are now approved for. But generally, the assessments are based on a format of either online knowledge testing. Obviously, the majority of you, if not all, will be familiar with uh, online testing for VRQs, things like that. Uh, it's exactly the same format. You can invigilate and conduct your own assessments, knowledge assessments for that. Uh, workshop tasks. So 
uh, whether they're workshops in the training provider or elsewhere, dependent on the route again. Uh, they, it could be predominantly based on skills tasking uh, or skills standards. Computer-based videos, uh, presentations, professional discussions, or professional interviews. There's a lot of different terminology, but the, the actual how they're conducted are predominantly the same, utilizing technology. So they're the different types of assessments that an, an apprentice can expect. And you can see there, there's the link to the IFATE, IMI awarding website and the IMI site. There's a huge amount of information you can access by those links uh, with further detail, guidance documents and everything relating to all the different assessment plans. Uh, if you go onto the IMI specific sites, and obviously we solely concentrate on our own uh, standards that we're offering and supporting the training providers with. Thank you, Georgia. So the level three light vehicle EPA. So as I've already touched on, mandated requirements. And again, all the, everything that I'm referring to here is simply taken straight out of the assessment plan. There is nothing that the IMI have added to this or put in it in addition to the assessment plan. We're not allowed to do that as an endpoint assessment organization. So everything within these, when I refer to mandated requirements or mandated prerequisites, that is simply what is in the assessment plan. And the assessment plan is what has been derived by an employer group. It has nothing to do with the IMI. We have not instigated these assessments. We are just following the instructions as specified in the assessment plan. So every assessment plan will have prerequisites in place. Where, and again, for light vehicle, as I've already touched on, that consists of a logbook, behavioral assessment, maths, English, and refrigerant handling qualification, plus the tri-party agreement. Every assessment plan will require a tri-party agreement. The rest of them on maths and English is all, also a mandated requirement in everyone. Um, but there may be some slight variations then with other prerequisite qualifications, for example. But again, you need to look into the assessment plan for the mandated requirements for that. As I said, the online assessments. So for light vehicle, that consists of two online assessments, test A, test B. Test A consists of 40 questions, lasting 45 minutes. And then test B consists of 60 questions, lasting up to one hour, 15 minutes. And as I said, these normally would have to be passed before the learner or the apprentice could progress onto the skills task. However, current flexibilities does allow an apprentice to progress at the moment without passing these. The pass mark for both of those online tests are 65%. Skills testing for light vehicle again, for APO3, which is the latest version, consists of five skills tasks, diagnostic or diagnose and repair tasks, uh, scheduled over two days. So it's two days of assessments for an apprentice and the apprentice needs to go through those two days and pass all five tasks and the associated criteria for those tasks. Upon completing that, final EPA element for light vehicle, as I've said, is the one hour professional discussion, which is solely based on behaviors and competency evidence, which is in the form of job cards that have been uploaded for four separate diagnosis and replacement tasks and a service task. So again, there's more information. I'm sure that Elizabeth and her team with the logbook webinars to follow up after this, we're going to far greater detail around the logbook requirements and things like that. Upon completing the EPA, there is then the EPA feedback. So I might provide feedback upon completion of the assessment period. If required, an apprentice can be put forward for either a resit or a retake. Whether it's a resit or retake, that is down to the training provider. Resit is on the discretion that if you feel that the apprentice has failed because of a silly mistake, or if it's a knowledge assessment, they fell by a couple of percent and they don't particularly need additional learning, then that is down to you to record it. We won't check this at all as an endpoint assessment organization, but you would be checked by Ofsted. Uh, so you need to determine whether they can go straight in for a resit and have another attempt or whether they may need a month, two months, three months, 
for some additional learning and then be put forward for a retake. But again, that is solely down to yourselves. Moving on then, upon successful completion of all EPA elements, the apprenticeship certificate is then claimed for. Thank you, Georgia. So what's involved for the apprentice? EPA feedback is generated. We give feedback on all elements upon completion of the endpoint assessment. After the final assessment, this feedback is sent out and this feedback is sent to the employer, the apprentice and the training provider on the same day at the same time. And that will determine whether it's a pass, fail, merit, distinction, whatever the grading might be for that particular assessment uh, or standard. If the apprentice is successful, it is then down to the IMI to claim the apprenticeship certificate. So the training provider can no longer claim the apprenticeship certificate with apprenticeship standards. The IMI claim that as soon as we have completed the EPA assessment and it's been successful. Thanks, Georgia. So responsibility change. This is just a sort of brief outline of the differences now from between frameworks and standards. So you can see on the left hand side, this is based on the training providers responsibilities. Left hand side for framework, generally the training provider would be expected to complete all the relevant training, complete all workshop or workplace observations, sign off any portfolio evidence, observations, tasks, etc. Uh, monitor the progression of the portfolio or, and completion of the portfolio against the competencies. Complete sign off and claim BCQ certification. And again, the same for the BRQ certification. And then at the end of it, collate all of those separate components and submit a claim for the framework certificate. With standards, you can see there the training provider is required to complete a they need to register the learner, obviously, with the IMI. Uh, monitor progression. Any assessments, so they need to monitor any assessments or certification that are mandated. So again, as an example, with the light vehicle, it's mandated back to the gas. So it would be the training provider's responsibility to ensure that they are in place before submitting that apprentice to EPA. Provide off the job training and allocate an assessor or equivalent. Now, I've got a set or equivalent here because within the apprenticeship standards, the training provider is not actually required to do any assessment. That is all done by the, by the mentor or employer, which I'll come on to in a minute. So there's a lot of different terminology now because of the change of roles, but it's predominantly what the assessor would have done, gone out and monitored the development of that learning in the workplace, monitoring the progression, things like that. Uh, they'd also be responsible for the coordination of the apprenticeship with the employer, mentor, and the EPAO. So the training provider acts like a pivot, if you like, um, and ensures that all the parties are aware of what is going on, what the processes are, and what the end outcome is. So they coordinate or oversee the whole journey, if you like, is the easiest way of putting it, I suppose. Okay, if you move on. I don't know if any of the IMI staff can confirm whether my speaker is or my microphone is working a lot your microphone is working tony but it's slightly crackly right okay sorry about that i can't seem to change anything on my settings so you're going to have to bear with me i'm afraid it's working fine now okay thank you cheers barry so changing responsibilities with regard to the employer then so again i've broken it down frameworks on the left standards on the right now here you can see there is a significant move with responsibilities with apprenticeship standards frameworks. The employer had relatively few responsibilities. So providing a workplace mentor, liaise with a uh, training provider to monitor the progression, complete reviews, that type of thing, and provide a witness testimony to sign off certain bits of work from the workplace. That was about it. With standards, and this is all taken from 
assessment plans and guidance within there. It's down to the employer to provide a workplace mentor. They must have a workplace mentor. That mentor will also assist with workplace training. They will assist with the collection of evidence that is required within the logbook. And it's the mentor from the workplace that passes judgment and signs off that evidence to say that the apprentice is competent. It is not the training provider that signs that off. That is a key change. They also need to contribute to the behavior assessment. And finally, as I said earlier in the slides, the tripartite agreement, the employer stroke mentor signs off the tripartite agreement and states that everything is being met uh, for EPA and they're happy for that apprentice to progress. Okay, thanks. Sure. Employer responsibilities. Again, just expand a little bit more again, responsible for allocating a workplace mentor, and it's the, the employer who coordinates with the training provider to confirm that all requirements are in place to pass all the phases of the apprenticeship standard, and that all the required competencies have been met in full. As I said, that is signed off by all three parties prior to EPA. Okay, moving on. So the mentor, again, the mentor, depending on the size of the organization, this could be the employer, um, or it could be in large organizations, somebody nominated to be the mentor on the workshop floor. Uh, but they will be allocated, or they will need to allocate a mentor to the apprentice. That mentor will assist with workplace training, development, progression, that type of thing, and signing off work to go into the log book, competencies in the log book. And it's down to them to pass judgment, not the training provider to pass judgment on whether that evidence is sufficient or whether that apprentice is ready to progress onto EPA. They also contribute to the behavior assessment, which is utilized within the professional discussion to grade the apprentice on whether they've met, um, exceeded or not met the behavioral competencies. Okay, thanks, Georgia. Training provider again, a bit more in depth. So they're responsible for the coordination of the apprentice with the employer, mentor, and the employer assessment organization. Obviously, there's a hell of a lot of information available that we need to make sure all parties are aware of. IMI to do a lot of support documentation and everything else. I would strongly advise that the training provider makes the employer and the uh, apprentice are aware of all of that support documentation at the earliest opportunity. They are required to provide off the job training as outlined in the assessment plan, minimum 20%, and will arrange for the registration progression and acquiring or putting the apprentice through any qualifications to meet mandated prerequisites. Thanks, Georgia. And then finally, the IMI, the EPAO. So we will provide uh, training, uh, assessment documentation for all of the knowledge aspects, the skills and the behaviors for all parties to, uh, to use. We will ensure that all the assessment of the apprentice meets the standard. As I say, we only follow the guidance or the requirements within the assessment plan. So we just ensure that whatever assessments take place, meet the requirements of the assessment plan. And then it is the IMI, is the Endpoint Assessment Organization, who has the final say off the back of the completion of assessments on whether that apprentice has passed or failed. Thanks, Georgia. For those who are attending this uh, webinar, who may not be aware, there's been loads and loads of uh, articles, publications, and everything else with regard to the end of frameworks. Apprenticeship frameworks cease the end of this month, 31st of July, 2020. You will know, nobody will be able to register an apprentice on an apprenticeship framework after the 31st of July. So if you have got learners who are transitioning from level two to level three, or have just completed the level two, and you want them to go on to frameworks rather than standards, you have just over a week to get them registered. If you go past the 31st of July, your only option is to transition on to apprenticeship standards. Okay, Georgia. 
So hopefully we've been having some, or you've been submitting some questions to uh, the panel in the background and they've been answering them, but we'll spend a couple of minutes. Uh, if you've got any additional questions to ask, please submit them now and uh, I'll open up the Q and A box inbox. And if we can answer any questions in the next couple of minutes live, we'll do that. So please take that opportunity. If not, everything that we've covered will be made available to all the attendees uh, anyway, along with the questions and the answers or the responses. So you will be able to go back through, through that. So if you have got any questions, please, we'll spend a couple of minutes, um, just take the time to review those questions and answer them. If not, we can move on to the final uh, couple of slides. So. Tony, we've got um, an interesting question from Paul McGill, if you'd like to um, answer that one. Yeah, just a sec, I'll open that up. So Paul, uh, bum, 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 Paul McGill. Okay, so can an employer request apprentice is put forward for EPA, even if training provider is not happy to sign tripartite agreement? If so, where does that leave the training provider, especially if the apprentice fails assessment? Right, thanks for that, Paul. Um, short answer. If all three parties have not signed the tripartite agreement, IMI as an endpoint assessment organization or any other endpoint assessment organization cannot conduct an EPA. So if your example, if a training provider is not happy and does not sign the tripartite agreement, then an EPA will not take place. It is a mandated requirement that all three parties must sign. Okay, so three signatures saying that they're happy, or those uh, differences need to be resolved and then the booking submitted and moved on from there. I hope that's uh, covered everything there. Paul, um, Malcolm, just had a question from Malcolm Hewitson. Thanks, Malcolm. Are you aware of any framework registration procedures for the devolved governments? Okay, so with regard to registrations, all of the registrations for devolved or devolved nations, I'm taking it, Malcolm, you're referring to there. As far as the devolved nations, all of the expiry dates and everything is available online. Um, there are some, I believe, Scottish qualifications that have been extended, but that's not really my area of expertise. But to get everything you need on that, I'd recommend you contact your EQA, uh, who will be able to go through that uh, case by case on whatever your requirements are. But yes, there are some variations. Obviously, apprenticeship standards is England only. Uh, with the devolved nations and frameworks, there are some other changes going on there with extensions to qualifications and things like that. Okay. And I think that's it. I've got no other questions on my screen at the moment. So Thank you very much for the questions. As I said, if you do have any additional questions that come to mind, please don't hesitate in contacting any of the IMI staff or the IMI EPA staff, and we will get back to you uh, and respond to them. The last slide here, useful links, which you'll have access to IMI apprenticeship standards. Obviously we've got multiple standards we're approved for now, 20 standards, I think, uh, with specific support and documentation for all of those standards. Uh, available on our website is the IFATE Apprentice uh, Hub. You can access that. There's also further detail on the Apprentice Hub with regard to the uh, relaxations I was talking about where you can take assessments in different orders or you don't have to pass certain areas before you can move on. And finally the IMI Awarding website. Again there's a whole assortment of support documents for the apprentice, the employer, and the trained provider on that on that website again specific to each standard so you've got access to that please feel free to utilize any of those okay so that brings us to an end of this webinar i hope you find or you have found it useful and you've taken something away from this if you do have any questions like i said please feel free to ask and we will get back to you uh, and all of this will be sent out as well i believe uh, shortly and it all will be made available on our website so thank you very much for joining us and again thank you for the panelists and support in the background as well answering all the questions thanks very much <laughs>